Gems of Buddhist Wisdom The Path to Supreme Bliss, 10 Adapted from various sources All human beings want to be happy. All human beings seek happiness. Man's search for happiness has gone on from age to age. But it can never be found in the way it is sought in merely adjusting the conditions of the external world and ignoring the internal world of mind. The history of the world proves this. Social reforms, economic reforms, legal reforms, and political reforms, however well-intentioned and well-calculated they may have been, have never brought complete and genuine happiness to man. Why? When one set of unsatisfactory conditions that have appeared has been eliminated, another rears its head, and when that is eliminated yet another appears. This appearance and reappearance, this rise and fall is of the essence of all mundane things and conditions. There can never be any mass production of true happiness. It is something personal and individual. It comes from within and not without. It is not so much the external world that one has to explore in the search for happiness as the internal world of mind. Modern science declares that nothing in the universe is static. Everything is dynamic, everything is in motion. Nothing stands still. We either go forward or backward. We grow better and happier or else we grow in the direction of evil and thus accumulate sorrow. To be happy is to overcome sorrow. To overcome sorrow, the Buddha shows humanity the path that leads to the eradication of all sorrows. The path to happiness is the Noble Eightfold Path. This path must have been trodden by someone before it can be called a path. There is inherent in the word path the idea that someone had trod it before. A path cannot come into existence all of a sudden. Someone must have first cut through a jungle, cleared a way and walked along it. Similarly, the Noble Eightfold Path has been trodden before J.Y. many a Buddha in the past. It has also been trodden before by many a Paxka Buddha and many an Arahant. The Buddha only discovered the path but did not create it, since it existed from the ancient past. Indeed it is an ancient path, Pereru, Mega. The Noble Eightfold Path is a path to be trodden. The path is something essentially practical. To know and experience this truth one must tread the path. This path contains a careful and wise collection of all the important requisites necessary for the spiritual development of man. The Noble Eightfold Path is subdivided into three groups. Ethical Conduct, Mental Discipline, and Wisdom, Sila, Samadhi, and Panna. This path is unique to Buddhism and distinguishes it from every other religion and philosophy. It is the Buddhist code of mental and physical conduct which leads to the end of suffering, sorrow, and despair. To perfect peace, Nibbana. The eight factors of the path are 1. Right understanding, Samadhithd, wisdom, Panna. 2. Right thought, Samasamkapa, wisdom, Panna. 3. Right speech, Samavaka, Ethical Conduct, Sila. 4. Right Action, Samakamanta, Ethical Conduct, Sila. 5. Right Livelihood, Samajiva, Ethical Conduct, Sila. 6. Right Effort, Samavayama, Mental Discipline, Samadhi. 7. Right Mindfulness, Samasats, Mental Discipline, Samadhi. 8. Right Concentration, Samasamad, Mental Discipline, Samadhi. Referring to this path, in the first discourse, the Buddha called it the middle path, Majayahima Patipada. Because it avoids two extremes, indulgence in sensual pleasures which is low. Worldly and leads to harm is one extreme, self-torture in the form of severe asceticism which is painful. Low and leads to harm is the other. It must always be borne in mind that the term path is only a figurative expression. Though conventionally we talk of treading a path, in the ultimate sense the eight steps signify eight mental factors. They are interdependent and interrelated, and at the highest level they function simultaneously. They are not followed and practiced one after the other in numerical order. Even on the lower level each and every factor should be tinged with some degree of right understanding. For it is the keynote of Buddhism. In strong language the Buddha did warn his follow ERS against mere book learning thus. Though he recites the sacred texts a lot, but acts not accordingly. 
that heedless man is like a cowherd counting others' cattle, not obtaining the products of the cow. He shares not the fruits of the tranquil man. Though he recites only a little of the sacred texts, but acts in accordance with the teaching. Abandoning lust, hate and delusion, possessed of right understanding. His mind entirely released and clinging to nothing here or hereafter. He shares the fruits of the tranquil man. The achievement of the final goal of Buddhism, Nibbana, does not call for a mastery over the deep and abstruse philosophy of Buddhism. What is required is a progressive development of the mind through a process of ethical conduct and meditation. Being established in moral conduct and training the mind. One realizes the knowledge which leads to deliverance, the Buddha declared. Ethical Conduct Now, in ethical conduct, sila, based on love and compassion, are included three factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Namely, right speech, right action and right livelihood. The Buddha expounded his teaching for the good of the many. For the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world. Siddha, the initial stage of the path, is based on this loving compassion. Why should one refrain from harming and robbing others? Is it not because of love for self and others? Why should one succor the poor, the needy, and those in distress? Is it not out of compassion for them? To abstain from evil and do good is the function of sila, the code of ethical conduct taught in Buddhism. This function is never void of loving compassion. Siddha embraces within it qualities of the heart, such as love, modesty, tolerance, pity, charity, and happiness at the success of others. According to Buddhism for a man to be perfect there are two qualities that he should develop equally. Compassion, Karuna, on one side, and Wisdom, Panna, on the other. Here compassion represents love, charity, kindness, tolerance, and such noble qualities on the emotional side or qualities of the heart. While wisdom would stand for the intellectual side or the qualities of the mind. If one develops only the emotional neglecting the intellectual, one may become a good-hearted fool. While to develop only the intellectual side neglecting. The emotional may turn one into a hard-hearted intellect without feeling for others. Therefore, to be perfect one has to develop both equally. Right speech means abstention. From telling lies. Backbiting and slander and talk that may bring about hatred, enmity, disunity, and disharmony among individuals or groups of people. Harsh, rude, impolite, malicious, and abusive language, and idle, useless, and foolish babble and gossip. When one abstains from these forms of wrong and harmful speech one naturally has to speak the truth, has to use words that are friendly and benevolent, pleasant and gentle, meaningful and useful. One should not speak carelessly, speech should be at the right time and place. If one cannot say something useful, one should keep noble silence. Right action is abstention from killing, stealing, and illicit sexual indulgence, and cultivating compassion, taking only things that are given, and living pure and chaste. Right livelihood is abandoning wrong ways of living which bring harm and suffering to others, trafficking in arms and lethal weapons, in animals for slaughter, in human beings, i.e. dealing in slaves which was prevalent during the time of the Buddha, in intoxicating drinks and poisons and living by a profession which is blameless and free from harm to oneself and others. One can clearly see here that Buddhism is strongly opposed to any kind of war. When it lays down that trade in arms and lethal weapons is an evil and unjust means of livelihood. It should be realized that the Buddhist ethical and moral conduct aims at promoting a happy and harmonious life both for the individual and for society. This moral conduct is considered as the indispensable foundation for all higher spiritual attainments. No spiritual development is possible without this moral basis. These moral principles aim at making society secure by promoting unity, harmony, and right relations among people. In Buddhism ethical conduct is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. Perfect conduct divorced from a purpose, not directed to a desirable end has but little meaning from the Buddhist point of view. Not only evil but also good must be transcended. Even the teachings of the Buddha have to be transcended. 
the Buddha has compared his teachings to a raft to be used by us Nisaranatthaya i.e. for the purpose of crossing over in safety, and Nagahanatthaya i.e. not for the purpose of retention. Once we have reached the other shore, we do not have to carry the raft WTH us. It has to be put aside. Mental Discipline Next comes Mental Discipline, in which are included three other factors of the Eightfold Path. Namely Right Effort, Right Mindfulness, and Right Concentration. Right Effort, is the persevering endeavor to prevent the arising of evil and unwholesome thoughts that have not yet arisen in a man's mind. To discard such evil thoughts already arisen. To produce and develop wholesome thoughts not yet arisen and to promote and maintain the good thoughts already present. The function of right effort, therefore, is to be vigilant and check all unhealthy thoughts. And to cultivate, promote, and maintain wholesome and pure thoughts arising in a man's mind. The prudent man who masters his speech and his physical actions through sila, ethical conduct, now makes every endeavor to scrutinize his thoughts, his mental factors, and to avoid distracting thoughts. Right mindfulness is to be diligently aware, mindful, and attentive with regard to the activities of the body, kaya, sensations or feelings, vedana, the activities of the mind, siddha, and ideas, thoughts, conceptions, and things, dhamma. The practice of concentration on breathing, anapanasati, is one of the well-known exercises, connected with the body, for mental development. There are several other ways of developing attentiveness in relation to the body, as modes of meditation. With regard to sensations and feelings, one should be clearly aware of all forms of feelings and sensations, pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, of how they appear and disappear within oneself. Concerning the activities of mind, one should be aware whether one's mind is lustful or not, given to hatred or not, deluded or not distracted or concentrated, etc. In this way one should be aware of all movements of mind, how they arise and disappear. As regards ideas, thoughts, conceptions, and things, one should know their nature. How they appear and disappear, how they are developed, how they are suppressed and destroyed, and so on. The third and last factor of mental discipline is right concentration leading to the four stages of Hana generally called trance or recuiement. In the first stage of yahana, passionate desires and certain unwholesome thoughts like sensuous lust, ill will, languor, worry, restlessness, and doubt are discarded, and feelings of joy and happiness are maintained, along with certain mental activities. In the second stage, all intellectual activities are suppressed, tranquility and one-pointedness of mind developed and the feelings of joy and happiness are still retained. In the third stage, the feeling of joy, which is an active sensation, also disappears, while the disposition of happiness still remains in addition to mindful equanimity. In the fourth stage of Hana, all sensations, even of happiness and unhappiness, of joy and sorrow, disappear, only pure equanimity and awareness remaining. Thus the mind is trained and disciplined and developed through right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Wisdom The remaining two factors namely, right understanding and right thought go to constitute wisdom. Thought includes thoughts of renunciation, nekamasamkapa, goodwill, avyapadasamkapa, and of compassion or non-harm, avihimsasamkapa. These thoughts are to be cultivated and extended towards all living beings irrespective of race, caste, clan, or creed. As they embrace all that breathes there are no compromising limitations. The radiation of such ennobling thoughts is not possible for one who is egocentric and selfish. A man may be intelligent, erudite, and learned, but if he lacks right thoughts, he is. According to the teachings of the Buddha, a fool, Bala not a man of understanding and insight. If we view things with dispassionate discernment, we will understand that selfish desire, hatred and violence cannot go together with true wisdom. Right understanding or true wisdom is always permeated with right thoughts and never bereft of them. Right understanding is the understanding of things as they are. And it is the four noble truths that explain things as they really are. 
right understanding therefore is ultimately reduced to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. This understanding is the highest wisdom which sees the ultimate reality. According to Buddhism there are two sorts of understanding. What we generally call understanding is knowledge, an accumulated memory. An intellectual grasping of a subject according to certain given data. This is called knowing accordingly, Anubhadha. It is not very deep. Real deep understanding is called penetration, Padavidha, seeing a thing in its true nature, without name and label. This penetration is possible only when the mind is free from all impurities and is fully developed through meditation. Right understanding or penetrative wisdom is the result of continued and steady practice of meditation or careful cultivation of the mind. To one endowed with right understanding it is impossible to have a clouded view of phenomena. For he is immune from all impurities and has attained the unshakable deliverance of the mind, Akupasito Vimiti. Keep to the path. These sayings of the Buddha explain the function and the purpose of cultivating ethical conduct, mental discipline, and wisdom. Deliverance means living experience of the cessation of the three root causes of evil, greed, hatred and delusion or ignorance, labha, dosa, and moha, that assail the human mind. These root causes are eliminated through ethical conduct, mental discipline, and wisdom. Thus it is clear that the Buddha's teaching aims at the highest purification, perfect mental health, free from all tainted impulses. Now this deliverance from mental taints, this freedom from ill, lies absolutely and entirely in a man's own hands. In those of no one else, human or divine. Not even a Supreme Buddha can redeem a man from the fetters of existence except by showing him the path. The path of Siddha, Samadhi, Panna are sometimes referred to as the threefold training, Tividhasaka, and none of them is an end in itself. Each is a means to an end. One cannot function independently of the others. As in the case of a tripod which falls to the ground if a single leg gives way. So here one cannot function without the support of the others. These three go together supporting each other. Siddha or ethical conduct strengthens mental discipline and mental discipline in tum promotes wisdom. Wisdom helps one to get rid of the clouded view of things. To see life as it really is, that is to see life and all things pertaining to life as arising and passing away. In spite of the scientific knowledge that is steadily growing the people of the world are restless and racked with fear and discontent. They are intoxicated with the desire to gain fame, wealth, power, and to gratify the senses. To this troubled world still seething with hate, distrust, selfish desire, and violence. Most timely is the Buddha's message of love and understanding. The Noble Eightfold Path, leading to the realization of Nibbana. A mere knowledge of the path however complete, will not do. In this case, our function is to follow it and keep to it. The path is indeed difficult, but if we, with constant heedfulness and complete awareness, walk it watching our steps, we will one day reach our destination. A child learns to stand and walk gradually and with difficulty. So too have all great ones moved from stage to stage through repeated failure to final success. It is a path leading to the realization of ultimate reality, to complete freedom, happiness and peace through moral, spiritual and intellectual perfection. From this brief account of the path, one may see that it is a way of life to be followed, practiced and developed by each individual. It is self-discipline in body, word and mind, self-development and self-purification. It has nothing to do with belief, prayer, worship or ceremony. Gems of Buddhist Wisdom Facts of Life, 11 By Venerada Mahathera We live in an ill-balanced world. It is not rosy, nor is it totally thorny. The rose is soft, beautiful, and fragrant, but the stem on which the rose flower grows is full of thorns. Because of the rose, one tolerates the thorns. However, one will not disparage the rose on account of the thorns. To an optimist, this world is absolutely rosy, to a pessimist, it is absolutely thorny. But to a realist, this world is neither absolutely rosy nor absolutely thorny. It abounds with both beautiful roses and pricky thorns. An understanding person will not be infatuated by the beauty of the rose, but will view it as it is. 
knowing well the nature of the thorns, he will view them as they are and will take the precaution not to be hurt. Like the pendulum that perpetually moves from right to left, four desirable and four undesirable conditions prevail in this world. Everyone without exception must face these conditions in the course of a lifetime. These conditions are Gain, Labha, and Loss, Alabha Honor, Yasa, and Dishonor, Ayasa Praise, Pasamsa, and Blame, Ninda Happiness, Sukha, and Sorrow, Dukkha Gain and Loss Businessmen, as a rule, are subject to both gain and loss. It is quite natural to be complacent when there is gain or profit. In itself there is nothing wrong. Such profits produce a certain amount of pleasure which the average man seek. Without these pleasurable moments, however temporary, life would not be worth living. In this competitive and chaotic world, it is right that people should enjoy some kind of happiness which gladdens their hearts. Such happiness, though material, is conducive to health and longevity. The problem arises in the case of loss. Profits are accepted smilingly, but not so the losses. The losses often lead to mental agony and sometimes suicidal tendencies arise when the losses are unbearable. It is under such adverse circumstances that one should exhibit high, moral courage and maintain a proper mental equilibrium. All of us have ups and downs while battling with life. One should be prepared for the good and the bad. Then there will be less disappointment. In the time of the Buddha, a noble lady was offering food to the venerable Sariputta and some monks. While serving them, she received a note stating that certain misfortunes had affected her family. Without becoming upset, she calmly kept the note in her waist pouch and served the monks as if nothing had happened. A maid who was carrying a pot of ghee to offer to the monks inadvertently slipped and broke the pot of ghee. Thinking that the lady would naturally feel sorry at the loss, Venerable Sariputta consoled her, saying that all breakable things are bound to break. The wise lady remarked, Banti, what is this trivial loss? I have just received a note stating certain misfortunes have occurred in my family. I accepted without losing my balance. I am serving you all despite the bad news. Such valor on the part of such a courageous lady should be highly commended. Once the Buddha went seeking alms in a village. Owing to the intervention of Mara the evil one, the Buddha did not obtain any food. When Mara questioned the Buddha rather sarcastically whether he was hungry or not, the Buddha solemnly explained the mental attitude of those who were free from impediments. And replied, Ah, happily do we live, we who have no impediments. Feeders of joy shall we be even as the gods of the radiant realm. On another occasion, the Buddha and his disciples observed the rainy period, Vasa, in a village at the invitation of a Brahmin who, however, completely forgot his duty to attend to the needs of the Buddha and the Sangha. Throughout a period of three months, although Venerable Magalana volunteered to obtain food by his psychic powers, the Buddha making no complaint, was contented with the fodder of horses offered by a horse dealer. Losses one must try to bear cheerfully with manly vigor. Unexpectedly one confronts them, very often in groups and not singly. One must face them with equanimity, upekha, and take it as an opportunity to cultivate that sublime virtue. Honor and dishonor. Honor and dishonor are another pair of inevitable worldly conditions that confront us in the course of our daily lives. Honor or fame, we welcome, dishonor we dislike. Honor gladdens our heart, dishonor disheartens us. We desire to become famous. We long to see our pictures in the papers. We are greatly pleased when our activities, however insignificant are given publicity. Sometimes we seek undue publicity too. Many are anxious to see their pictures in a magazine at any cost. To obtain an honor, some are prepared to offer gratification or give substantial donations to those in power. For the sake of publicity, some exhibit their generosity by giving alms to a hundred monks and even more. But they may be totally indifferent to the sufferings of the poor and the needy in the neighborhood. These are human frailties. Most people have ulterior motives. Selfless persons who act disinterestedly are rare in this world. Most worldlings have something up their sleeves. 
well, who is perfectly good? How many are perfectly pure in their motives? How many are absolutely altruistic? We need not hunt after fame or honor. If we are worthy of honor, it will come to us unsought. The bee will be attracted to the flower, laden with honey, the flower does not invite the bee. True indeed, we naturally feel happy, nay, extremely happy when our fame is spread far and wide. But we must realize that fame, honor, and glory are passing phases only. They soon vanish in thin air. How about dishonor? It is not palatable either to the ear or mind. We are undoubtedly perturbed when unkind words of disrepute pierce our ears. The pain of mind is still greater when the so-called report is unjust and absolutely false. Normally it takes years to erect a magnificent building. In a minute or two, with modern devastating weapons, it could easily be demolished. Sometimes it takes years or a lifetime to build up a good reputation. In no time the hard-earned good name can be ruined. Nobody is exempt from the devastating remark that begins with the ill-famed but. Yes, he is very good, he does this and that, but his whole good record is blackened by the so-called but. You may live the life of a Buddha but you will not be exempt from criticisms, attacks, and insults. The Buddha was the most famous and yet the most maligned teacher in his time. Some antagonists of the Buddha spread a rumor that a woman used to spend the night in the monastery. Having failed in this base attempt, they spread false news amongst the populace that the Buddha and his disciples murdered that very woman and hid her corpse in the rubbish heap of withered flowers within the monastery. The conspirators later admitted that they were the culprits. When his historic mission met success and when many sought ordination under him, his adversaries maligned him. Saying that he was robbing the mothers of their sons, depriving wives of their husbands, and that he was obstructing the progress of the nation. Failing in all these attempts to ruin his noble character, his own cousin, Devadatta, a jealous disciple of his, attempted to kill him by hurling a rock from above, but failed in his attempt. If such be the sad fate of the faultless, perfect Buddha, what can be the fate of imperfect ordinary mortals? The higher you climb a hill, the more conspicuous you become in the eyes of others. Your back is revealed but your front is hidden. The fault-finding world exhibits your shortcomings and misgivings but ignores your salient virtues. The winnowing fan thrashes the husks but retains the grains, the strainer, on the contrary, retains the gross remnants but drains out the sweet juice. The cultured take the subtle and remove the gross, the uncultured retain the gross, but remove the subtle. When you are misrepresented, deliberately or otherwise, Remember the advice of Epictetus. To think or say oh by his slight acquaintance and faint knowledge of myself, I am lightly criticized. But if I am known better, more serious and much greater would be the accusations against me. It is needless to waste time in correcting the false reports unless circumstances compel you to necessitate a clarification. The enemy is gratified when he sees that you are hurt. That is what he actually expects. If you are indifferent, such misrepresentations will fall on deaf ears. In seeing the faults of others, we should behave like a blind person. In hearing unjust criticism of others, we should behave like a deaf person. In speaking ill of others, we should behave like a dumb person. It is not possible to put a stop to false accusations, reports, and rumors. The world is full of thorns and pebbles. It is impossible to remove them. But, if we have to walk in spite of such obstacles, instead of trying to remove them, which is impossible, it is advisable to wear a pair of slippers and walk harmlessly. The Dhamma teaches. Be like a lion that trembles not at sounds. Be like the wind that does not cling to the meshes of a net. Be like a lotus that is not contaminated by the mud from which it springs. Wander alone like a rhinoceros. Being the kings of the forest. Lions are fearless. By nature they are not frightened by the roaring of other animals. In this world, we may hear adverse reports, false accusations, degrading remarks of uncurbed tongues. Like a lion, we should not even listen to them. Like the boomerang, false reports will end where they began. Dogs bark, but the caravans move on peacefully. We are living in a muddy world. 
numerous lotuses spring there from without being contaminated by the mud, they adorn the world. Like lotuses we should try to lead blameless and noble lives, unmindful of the mud that may be thrown at us. We should expect mud to be thrown at us instead of roses. Then there will be no disappointments. Though difficult, we should try to cultivate non-attachment. Alone we come, alone we go. Non-attachment is happiness in this world. Unmindful of the poisonous darts of uncurbed tongues, alone we should wander serving others to the best of our ability. It is rather strange that great men have been slandered, vilified, poisoned, crucified, or shot. Great Socrates was poisoned. Noble Jesus Christ was ruthlessly crucified. Harmless Mahatma Gandhi was shot. Well, is it dangerous to be too good? Yes, during their lifetime they were criticized, attacked, and killed. After death, they were deified and honored. Great men are indifferent to honor or dishonor. They are not upset when they are criticized or maligned for they work not for name or honor. They are indifferent whether others recognize their services or not. To work, they have the right but not to the fruit thereof. Praise and blame. Praise and blame are two more worldly conditions that affect mankind. It is natural to be elated when praised and to be depressed when blamed. Amidst praise and blame, the Buddha says, the wise exhibit neither elation nor depression. Like a solid rock that is not shaken by the wind they stand unmoved. Praise, if worthy, is pleasing to the ears. If unworthy, as in the case of flattery, though pleasing, it is deceptive. But they are all sounds which will produce no effect if they do not reach our ears. From a worldly standpoint a word of praise goes a long way. By praising a little, a favor can easily be obtained. One word of merited praise is sufficient to attract an audience before one speaks. If, at the outset a speaker praises the audience, he will have an attentive ear. If he criticizes the audience at the outset the response will not be satisfactory. The cultured do not resort to flattery, nor do they wish to be flattered by others. The praiseworthy, they praise without being envious. The blameworthy, they blame not contemptuously but out of compassion with the object of reforming them. Many who knew the Buddha intimately, extolled his virtues in their own way. One Upali, a millionaire, a new follower, praised the Buddha enumerating a hundred virtues extempore. Nine sterling virtues of the Buddha that were current in his time are still being recited by his followers looking at his image. They are a subject of meditation to the devout. These well-merited virtues are still a great inspiration to his followers. How about blame? The Buddha says, they who speak much are blamed. They who speak little are blamed. They who are silent are also blamed. In this world there is none who is not blamed. Blame seems to be a universal legacy of mankind. The majority of the people in the world, remarks the Buddha, are ill-disciplined. Just as an elephant in the battlefield endures all arrows shot at him, even so, the Buddha suffers all insults. The deluded and the wicked are prone to seek only the ugliness in others but not the good and beautiful. None, with the single exception of a Buddha, is perfectly good. Nobody is totally bad either. There is evil in the best of us. There is good in the worst of us. He who silences himself like a cracked gong when attacked, insulted, and abused, he, I say the Buddha exhorts, is in the presence of Nibbana although he has not yet attained Nibbana. One may work with the best of motives. But the outside world very often misconstrues him and will impute motives never even dreamt by him. One may serve and help others to the best of one's ability sometimes by incurring debts or selling one's articles or property to save a friend in trouble. But later, the deluded world is so constituted that those very persons whom one has helped will find fault with him, blackmail him, blemish his good character and will rejoice in his downfall. In the Jataka stories, it is stated that Guttala the musician taught everything he knew to his pupil without a closed fist. But the ungrateful young man unsuccessfully tried to compete with his teacher and ruin him. On one occasion, the Buddha was invited by a Brahmin for alms to his house. As invited, the Buddha, visited his house. Instead of entertaining him, he poured a torrent of abuse with the filthiest words. 
the Buddha politely inquired. Do visitors come to your house, good Brahmin? Yes he replied. What do you do when they come? Oh, we prepare a sumptuous feast. If they fail to turn up. Why we gladly partake of it. Well, good Brahmin, you have invited me for alms and you have entertained me with abuse. I accept nothing. Please take it back. The Buddha did not retaliate. Retaliate not the Buddha exhorts. Hatreds do not cease through hatreds but through love alone they cease. There was no religious teacher so highly praised as the Buddha and so severely criticized, reviled and blamed as the Buddha. Such is the fate of great men. The Buddha was accused of murdering a woman assisted by his disciples. Non-Buddhists severely criticized the Buddha and his disciples to such an extent that the Venerable Ananda appealed to the Buddha to leave for another village. How, Ananda, if those villagers also abuse us? Well then, Lord, we will proceed to another village. Then, Ananda, the whole of, India will have no place for us. Be patient. These abuses will automatically cease. Magandinya, a lady of the harem, had a grudge against the Buddha for speaking ill of her attractive figure when her father, through ignorance, wished to give her in marriage to the Buddha. She hired drunkards to insult the Buddha in public. With perfect equanimity, the Buddha endured the insults. Insults are the common lot of humanity. The more you work and the greater you become, the more you are subject to insult and humiliation. Socrates was insulted by his own wife. Whenever he went out to help others his intolerant wife used to scold him. One day as she was unwell, she failed to perform her usual unruly task. Socrates left home on that day with a sad face. His friends inquired why he was sad. He replied that his wife did not scold him on that day as she was unwell. Well, you ought to be happy for not getting that unwelcome scolding, remarked his friends. Oh no! When she scolds me, I get an opportunity to practice patience. Today I missed that opportunity. That is the reason why I am sad answered the philosopher. These are memorable lessons for all. When insulted, we should think we are given an opportunity to practice patience. Instead of being offended, we should be grateful to our adversaries. Happiness and Sorrow Happiness and sorrow are the last pair of opposites. They are the most powerful factors that affect mankind. What can be born with ease is sukha, happiness, what is difficult to bear is dukkha, sorrow. Ordinary happiness is the gratification of a desire. As soon as the thing desired is gained then we desire some other kind of happiness. So insatiate are our selfish desires. The enjoyment of sensual pleasures is the highest and only happiness to an average person. There is no doubt that there is some momentary happiness in the anticipation, gratification and recollection of such material pleasures. This kind of happiness is highly prized by the sensualist but it is illusory and temporary. Can material possessions give one genuine happiness? If so, millionaires should not feel frustrated with life. In a certain country which has reached the zenith of material progress, a good number suffer from mental diseases. Why should it be so if material possessions alone can give happiness? Can dominion over the whole world produce true happiness? Alexander, who triumphantly marched to India, conquering the lands on the way, sighed for not having more pieces of earth to conquer. Very often the lives of statesmen who would wield power are at stake. The pathetic cases of Mahatma Gandhi and John F. Kennedy are illustrative examples. Real happiness is found within, and is not to be defined in terms of wealth, power, honors, or conquests. If such worldly possessions are forcibly obtained, or are misdirected, or even viewed with attachment, they will be a source of pain and sorrow for the possessors. What is happiness to one may not be happiness for another. What is meat and drink to one may be poison to another. The Buddha enumerates four kinds of happiness for a layman. They are the happiness of possession, athasuka, health, wealth, longevity, beauty, joy, strength, property, children, etc. The second source of happiness is derived by the enjoyment of such possessions, Pagasuka. Ordinarily, 
men and women wish to enjoy themselves. The Buddha does not advise to renounce their worldly pleasures and retire to solitude. The enjoyment of wealth lies not only in using it for ourselves but also in giving it for the welfare of others. What we eat is only temporary. What we preserve we leave and go. What we give we take with us. We are remembered forever by the good deeds we have done with our worldly possessions. Not falling into debt, Ananasuka, is another source of happiness. If we are contented with what we have and if we are economical, we need not be in debt to anyone. Debtors live in mental agony and are under obligation to their creditors. Though poor, when debt-free, we feel relieved and are mentally happy. Leading a blameless life, Anava Hyasuka, is one of the best sources of happiness for a layman. A blameless person is a blessing to himself and to others. He is admired by all and feels happier, being affected by the peaceful vibrations of others. It should be stated, however, that it is very difficult to get a good name from all. The noble-minded persons are concerned only with a blameless life and are indifferent to external approbation. The majority in this world delight themselves in enjoying pleasures while some others seek delight in renouncing them. Non-attachment or the transcending of material pleasures is happiness to the spiritual. Nibbanic bliss, which is the bliss of relief from suffering, is the highest form of happiness. Ordinary happiness we welcome, but not its opposite sorrow which is rather difficult to endure. Sorrow or suffering comes in different guises. We suffer when we are subjected to old age which is natural. With equanimity we have to bear the sufferings of old age. More painful than sufferings due to old age are sufferings caused by disease. Even the slightest toothache or headache is sometimes unbearable. When we are subject to disease, without being worried, we should be able to bear it at any cost. All, we must console ourselves thinking that we have escaped from a much more serious disease. Very often we are separated from our near and dear ones. Such separation causes great pain of mind. We should understand that all association must end with separation. Here is a good opportunity to practice equanimity. More often than not we are compelled to be united with the unpleasant which we detest. We should be able to bear them. Perhaps we are reaping the effects of our own kama, past, or present. We should try to accommodate ourselves to the new situation or try to overcome the obstacles by some other means. Even the Buddha, a perfect being, who had destroyed all defilements, had to endure physical suffering caused by disease and accidents. The Buddha was constantly subjected to headaches. His last illness caused him much physical suffering. As a result of Devadatta's hurling a rock to kill him, his foot was wounded by a splinter which necessitated an operation. Sometimes he was compelled to starve. Due to the disobedience of his own pupils, he was compelled to retire to a forest for three months. In a forest on a couch of leaves spread on a rough ground, facing piercing cold winds, he maintained perfect equanimity. Amidst pain and happiness he lived with a balanced mind. Death is the greatest sorrow we are compelled to face in the course of our wanderings in samsara. Sometimes, Death comes not singly but in numbers which may be difficult to endure. When a mother was questioned why she did not weep over the tragic death of her only son, she replied. Uninvited he came. Uninformed he went. As he came so he went. Why should we weep? What avails weeping? As fruits fall from a tree tender, ripe or old even so we die in our infancy, prime of mankind, or in old age. The sun rises in the east only to set in the west. Flowers bloom in the morning to fade in the evening. Inevitable death which comes to all without exception we have to face with perfect equanimity. Just as the earth whatever is thrown. Upon her, whether sweet or foul. Indifferent is to all alike. Nor hatred shows, nor amity. So likewise he is good or ill. Must even balanced ever be. The Buddha says, when touched by worldly conditions, the mind of an arahant never wavers. Amidst gain and loss, honor and dishonor, praise and blame, happiness and sorrow, let us try to maintain a balanced mind.